Hi there. Welcome back to the Bible and Christian Spiritual Formation. This is part two of lecture one and topic cycle one. So part two of lecture one, we're going to be talking about how the text is a joke. Before we do that, I did want to point out, I didn't do this in lecture number one, the icons behind me. I was looking for a good place in my house to do these videos. And other than in front of a bookshelf, which was getting ready to fall over, I thought I would come to the prettiest part of our house, one of the prettier parts of our house. So we have a lot of our icons here that our family's collected over the years. This is Peter and Paul embracing. We have the Archangel Michael right here. By the way, I feel like a, uh, a weather person trying to do both of these. Uh, we have a Russian cross here in the center. We have uh, the uh, forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob over here. It's kind of hard to see that one. We have uh, Mary and, uh, and child here in the center. And of course, up in the corner, you'll see the Trinity in the lower part of the, uh, of the Pentocrator icon. Anyway, for those of you who are interested. Um, this lecture is called The Text is a Joke, and of course that is a chapter that you're going to be reading if you have not yet already read it uh, in this course. Now like Peter Lightheart, I'm going to begin with a joke about a priest, a minister, and a rabbi. This is one of the only jokes that I can remember, and I probably tell it too much, but I don't think I've told it to you guys. So here it goes. A priest, a minister, and a rabbi are debating the question, when does life begin? Of course, the Catholic priest confidently says that life begins when the sperm meets the egg and fertilization begins. The minister, a Baptist minister, says, no, you're wrong. Life begins when the baby takes his or her first breath of God's beautiful, clean air. But then the rabbi pipes up and says, nope, no, you're both wrong. Life begins when the kids move out and the dog dies. Now, what Lightheart, I'm, I'm going to leave space for you to laugh. There we go. What Lightheart knows and what I'm learning is that scripture acts like a joke. It is not a joke in the derisive sense. It's not a farce. Nor is the Bible always laugh out loud funny, though sometimes it is. The Bible works instead like a joke in that there is something for us to get. There is a punchline. There is the plain reading, the surface reading that I mentioned in the earlier lecture, and that makes immediate sense to us. But there is much more beyond that, and what is beyond is something that we have to learn to get. Why do I think that my joke is funny? Now, while humor is in the ear of the beholder, there are some somewhat objective reasons why my joke could be funny. First, clergy people are funny by definition. We wear odd clothes, we only work one day a week, and we are treated simultaneously with the greatest of deference on one hand and with the utmost derision on the other. And in all honesty, how often do you see these three figures getting together? Which, by the way, I included in the resources a clip from a movie called Hail Caesar. This clip has no educative value, educational value to you. Uh, it's just humorous because it is a rabbi, a Catholic priest, an Orthodox priest, and some kind of generalized Protestant minister sitting around a table discussing a depiction of Jesus in a movie. It's all set in the 50s. If you've not seen the movie, it's the best part of the movie. Anyway, a second reason why I think my joke is funny is because the subject matter is so serious. Just think about what these three are talking about. They are debating when life begins with all of the attendant subjects that come with that, like abortion, contraception, and parenting. As the joke begins, we are made nervous just knowing the potential for the conflict. All of us have either been in a situation where we laughed or someone else did just in order to relieve the tension or because the tension was just so palpable there was nothing one could do but laugh. And third, and I think this is a really important issue, we laugh at a good joke because we're surprised. Sometimes we groan at a joke for the same reason. So getting the joke requires being surprised, at least a little bit. Now the element of surprise is the result that happens when our minds make connections between things 
that aren't immediately obvious to us. These connections are often semi-conscious or even unconscious. These interactions all meet in what I like to call a field of interaction or even a universe of interaction. So with our joke, rabbis, priests, and ministers are interacting with everything that we know about the debate of when life begins, with what we know about growing old and being glad that we have the house to ourselves again. There is a field here full of possible connections, references, and images. As an empty nester, I find the joke funny because it is so true. It just seems so true. And by the way, think of that phrase, so true. We laugh because it's true. We appreciate a joke or a story or a movie. We will say, when we appreciate it, we will sometimes say, oh, it is just so true. I think we use that phrase to describe when these connections get made within our fields of interaction. Here's a funny story from scripture. It happens in Acts chapter two. I think it's one of the best jokes that we can find in all of the Bible. It is Pentecost there in Acts chapter two and the followers of Jesus have just been touched by the Holy Spirit. They are, they are Galileans, so that by definition means they're not very sophisticated people. And they are noticed as speaking in foreign tongues. Now the disciples are undoubtedly excited, surprised, and maybe even a little freaked out by what's happening to them. And the best explanation by outside observers in this moment is simply, they are drunk. But Peter stands up and proclaims, these men aren't drunk as you suppose. After all, it's only nine in the morning. I laugh every time because I fill in the blanks. After Peter speaks, I fill in the blanks and say to myself, yeah, if you'd come by at quitting time, these guys would already be three sheets to the wind, but not now, not at nine in the morning. Give us a little time and they'll really get ripped. Of course, the idea of Jesus followers being drunk just seems really inappropriate. There is the evangelical subculture of my youth that says that drinking is of the devil. Then there is the silliness of them being drunk that early in the morning. But again, give those guys a couple of hours and they'll really be pulling a cork. Of course, it's funny because our modern thoughts about drinking and drunkenness are superimposed on the text. They interact with the text. Peter may or may not have been attempting to be funny. I wouldn't be surprised if he was trying to be funny here. But these two things meet again in that field of interaction that I referred to earlier. And thus, it strikes me as humorous. Note, this joke would not be funny to someone who is so young that they don't understand the social mores around drinking. A 10-year-old, no matter how precocious, won't really understand either the joke about the clergyman or the Acts chapter two joke. The joy of having the house to yourself and your spouse would be lost on them, as would the social implications of public drunkenness. At least I hope it would be lost on them. And this is because they don't share that same field of interaction. They've not had enough experience in life to recognize what is humorous in the story. Now, during these few weeks together, we will think about how figural reading or allegorical reading or spiritual reading all intersect. I encourage you, as I mentioned already, to think of scripture as a field of interaction where stories and images, ideas, metaphors, and symbols all intersect with each other to give us something more than the mere text on the page. Scripture is a place of meeting. It's a field of interaction. Again, I used the word in the last lecture, intertextuality. Scripture is a place where intertexts intersect with each other. The ramifications for this, theologically speaking, are massive. And the ramifications for prayer are massive too. And it is the latter of these two that is most important for our purposes in this class. Now, last semester, you spent a lot of time reading from the lectionary, along with the prayers and the canticles in the Book of Common Prayer. This exercise, as I've told you several times already, was designed to help you see and experience this field of interaction, recognizing that scripture itself is large enough for many lifetimes of discovering and exploring its figures and images. An opportunity to hear God's voice in the resonances, the connections within the texts, and even in the silences. 
Along with Peter Lightheart in The Text is a Joke, Richard Hayes, in his book Reading Backwards, is going to help us pay closer attention to these silences and also to these connections and resonances. His reading of Mark's gospel, I think, will open your eyes to some things happening in that text that require a broader field of interaction. Not only that, but Hayes demonstrates how much of what is going on in the gospel of Mark one has to get in the same way that you either get a joke or you don't. Mark's gospel is especially rich in this area. And I want to just mention on a personal level, The Gospel of Mark, for years and years and years, was my least favorite of the four Gospels. It felt like a rough draft. It felt like it was written in a rush. I just never really appreciated it on a deeper level. After interacting with what Richard Hayes has to say about the Gospel of Mark, I have a completely different viewpoint. I think the Gospel of Mark is a work of art. It is poetry. Uh, It is an amazing intertextual, interconnected piece of writing that was not written in a rush and that is by no means a rough draft. So even as you read it, and and maybe you feel these same kinds of tensions, I hope in reading Hayes' book, it will open up your eyes to the beauty and power that you find in the Gospel of Mark. Now, if you've not read it already, I look forward to your thoughts around Mark's apparent and yet not so apparent use of the book of Job when Mark provides the account of Jesus walking on the water. This is an example where few, I think, if any of us, would get the joke. It had to be pointed out to me uh, by Richard Hayes, and I'm grateful that he did. Now, as we proceed through the course, I want you to ask yourself that question. Did I get the joke? This is a question that we need to ask ourselves as we go forward. To get the joke, you have to be playing, if you will, in that field of interaction. You need to be out in that place of meeting. And in the process, I think you'll get it. It will take time. It will take effort. But I believe it is 100% worth it. When we hear resonances from Old Testament to New, and when we hear those same resonances within the New Testament itself or within the Old Testament itself, Of course, all of this requires imagination. As we started off in this lecture, you are developing a scriptural imagination. And as you read, I want you to ask yourself, what extra notes are you hearing? What overtones, if you will, in the text are you hearing? To use a musical metaphor. To use another metaphor, a food metaphor, maybe you should ask yourself, what taste notes are you picking up? Maybe you've been to a wine tasting or tasting coffee. Maybe you pick up a trace of licorice or chocolate or cherry. I never notice those things. (laughs) But I hope we will develop the muscles and the sensory ability to pick up on all those resonances and interconnections within Scripture. Finally, I want you to allow your imagination to play a little bit. Prayerfully, play in this field of interaction that we know as the Christian scriptures. 